Morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the technical problems. I was supposed to be streaming this directly myself and I started the stream. It lasted for about 12 seconds. An error message came up for some reason and it said, oh, go away. Uh, so I did and I tried to start it up again. It wasn't having any of it. Uh, Graham is indisposed this morning, but he's trying to set it up to begin with. But anyway, should we just try and get started? I've got to try and find some way of seeing the chat in a moment. It'll hopefully come up in a minute. Um, but I thought what we would do, oh, this may be it, um, is to have a little look at, um, uh, well, uh, there's lots of things going on, basically, um, a great many things going on. But I wanted to start with, I'm going to have to monkey about here. So the Le Anderson thing has a lot of things about it, which will be, uh, which will go over. But I thought I'd start off with the, this. So this idea that the Tories, like Sunak, will be quite desperate to resolve this for a number of reasons, which I'll go over. But Lee Anderson at the moment, if he if he I don't actually know what he really gets out of being in the Conservative Party at this point. I got before it helped raise his profile. Now, would he given that he's going to lose anyway, given that he is not going to be an MP after the election, would he be better going to reform UK? Richard Tice very obviously wants some, he wants an MP or two, or preferably six, in the House of Commons. Um, he'd love for a, a whole landslide of defections. He would absolutely love that. But he'll not get it because Tory MPs will recognise that Reform UK, despite their polling, are not actually going to win any seats. But if you if you sort of think to yourself, if you're a bit of a gammon, Tory MP, and you sort of think to yourself, you're not going to win anyway. And someone like Lee Anderson is not a natural Tory. You know, he, his attitudes may fit into the Tories as they are at the moment, but he'll never really fit in. And, and, and I have wondered if the same thing would be true of Reform UK. And then Ben Habib gave me that impression. So this is what he was reported to have said. Now, I'll have to move this. Um, let me have a look here. Yeah. And I'll just I'll just get rid of myself for a moment. So this is what Ben Habib has said. He told Times Radio he'd be a little bit suspicious. Circumspect is the word he used about Lee Anderson joining Reform UK. Now you think to yourself, what's Ben Habib got to do with it? Remember, Reform UK has hardly any members. I think it's got like five. Ben Habib is the deputy lead. Well, he's one of the deputy leaders. He and And Widdicombe are deputy leaders of Reform UK. So he said, so let's go through the quote here. He said, I would be quite circumspect about anyone who can't express themselves accurately, clearly, and in matters of great sensitivity without actually being able to identify properly what the issue is. I need to understand what he means by Islamist. I need to understand what's in his mind. Does he think there's a group of extreme Muslims controlling Sadiq, or does he think Sadiq is a prejudiced individual who's perpetrating, you know, divisive politics. And I'd say Sadiq Khan is probably the latter, not the former. And so Lee clearly hasn't got a grasp, in my view, of the language required to identify and address the problem. Now, let us be clear, none of them do because they're all pushing fake culture wars, right? They're all just pushing culture wars. What this sort of says to me is Ben Habib has an issue with Lee Anderson. He can't claim it's not because he's not being clear about what he's talking about because Ben Habib is not clear about what he's talking about because he doesn't want to be clear. The whole point of populism is to try and be all things to all people. So you need to deliberately keep details out of it. This, hence Brexit being built on what Michael Gove talked about, people sick of experts. Experts are clear. Experts are accurate. You don't want that as a populist. So I would have, uh, I would suggest here, what, what Lee Anderson is finding himself up against is the fact he's thrown his lot in with people who are essentially snobs. You know, he's a, pe the, the fact that he, he's a useful idiot to them, but he's not one of them. He was an ex-miner. He was on a really low income before he became an MP. You know, the, the, so he doesn't, he'll never really fit in with the Conservatives. Like, you know, I suggested maybe if he was canny, and he is cannier than some of the other troglodytes in the party, like Jonathan Gullis, but, but Jonathan Gullis would have a better chance. I always thought maybe Lee Anderson get himself in and then pop up in a couple of years 
in a like if he keeps his job on GB News, maybe move down to uh, um, maybe move down to a constituency that the Conservatives lose but lose narrowly, so they're expected to get it back again. Maybe get himself elected as uh, selected as the candidate there for the next election. He could maybe come back, but then part of me thinks, but he's not really one of them. He's not really one of them. He was selected as the candidate in Ashfield because it was basically a place that they didn't expect to win. Um, until, of course, all you know, everything kicked off in the latter quarter of 2019. That was before that point, you wouldn't have thought the Conservatives had a cat in L's chance of winning Ashfield. So it's um <laughs> Sarah just said he's a minor member of the Tory party. Well, he is, he is, is is you know, he is seen as useful to them at times. But I like Jonathan Gullis, private education, private background, you know, he could probably get him he could probably move somewhere and get himself selected in a in a sort of more traditional Tory seat at some point. I'm not sure Lee Anderson would. And I think this sort of speaks to the fact he's he's basically thrown his lot in with snobs. And snobs will never accept him. They'll, they'll be okay with him as useful idiots, but they'll never really see him as them. On the, you know, they'll see him as um, it's it's almost like they'll see him as like a, a private soldier, and they're like the officers. He's not allowed in the officers' mess unless it's to serve the drinks. Um, so that's what I think there. Now, in terms of other things, uh, you know, it's worth considering the mess that Rishi Sunak has landed himself in. Because consider, right, consider going back. Um, let's pull back a bit. At the start of this year, the Conservatives pushed their um, uh, their election strategy. You know, Isaac Levado, the Tory election strategist, was installed into Conservative campaign headquarters full time. Is there at CCHQ full time. Um, the whole place is heaving. It, they closed it down a year or two ago temporarily to save money. For the local elections, they even stopped the cleaners coming in. Now it's full; it's rammed. Right? It, they're spending hand over fist. I've been, I've had people tell me that they're now seeing Rishi Sunak adverts on, on my channel in the adverts. So they're ramping up the spending, and their budget is next week. A week tomorrow, they're announcing the budget. Right? This is their. This is what they want to do to kickstart properly, kickstart the election campaign. The idea is, um, the idea is that they have a. Uh, oh, sorry, I can come back now. Yeah, thank you. I was, I, I, I'm there. <laughs> the idea is, uh, at the start of the year, was to get the Rwanda safety bill through the House of Commons, which it now is, and then the strategy we are told by reports was to forget about the culture wars, certainly forget about that culture war, and focus on the economy they wanted everything to be about the economy and that is a credible report because that's what they've been doing they've been trying to talk about the economy ever since the rwanda safety bill cleared the commons they've been trying to always talk about the economy right and you might think that's a bold move for a government that's just brought us into recession but it's all they've got you know conservatives are just as standard as standard uh people believe that they're the party of the economy. It's absolute madness. Even now, Labour don't have a mass... They do have a lead on the economy, which is unusual. Consider they didn't have a lead on the economy in 1997. They still lost. Labour still won. But the Conservatives were still leading on the economy. Like They always lead on the economy, even when it's going badly. Now that's not the case. That's how bad things are. But it... it the gap is still closer on the economy with Labour than it is on anything else. Uh, Rob Alaris, £10 Super Chat, thank you very much. Um, but um, but it's all gone wrong because now Rishi Sunak is embroiled in this um, culture war, not of his making. This is not a planned culture war, Islamophobia in the Tory party. Think about it from Sunak's point of view, right? Budget in eight days' time. This is their big event. They want all the media attention on the budget, all of it on the budget. That's what they want talking about next week, the budget. Um, there's nothing else to distract. You know, we had by-elections last week. There's another by-election this week, which I keep forgetting about. That's the cursed Rochdale. I'm sorry if anyone's from Rochdale. You're cursed. You are absolutely cursed. 
Um, I gather the Tory candidate went is, is on holiday this week because they'd already planned this family holiday. They weren't expecting a by-election. Uh, so I think they're on holiday. Um, it's all a mess. The whole thing is a mess. But anyway, that's this week. And, and next week is supposed to be the budget. And you just think... If this is still raging, that's going to take that's going to distract from that budget, which was their big it was their big plan, cut income tax somehow, somehow and get the um, and get the, you know, people thinking, oh, things are getting better. You know, the old pre-election tax bribes. But it's all gone wrong because think about this. It's not just that it's a culture war that, that the Tories didn't choose. It's one that's splitting their party. You've got, I mean, I can't, I can't find it now. I think it was probably like um, the Daily Express. But one of these papers on their front page is all like, get, get Lee Anderson back, get Lee Anderson back. So you've got a wing of the Tory party and the one that's got the most sympathy in the media who are saying Lee Anderson needs to have the whip back. Obviously, Rishi Sunak cannot just give him the whip back because um, he, he would lose all pretense at authority then. I mean, Rishi Sunak has said that the only reason Lee Anderson lost the whip, because he it wasn't because of what he said, by the way, just for the, to be clear, the Tories have said he lost the whip because he refused to apologise. They haven't said that, uh, that his statement itself deserves removing the whip. It was only his refusal to apologise. So they sort of left the gate open for him. But then Lee Anderson yesterday said he'd refuse to apologise. That would be the wrong thing to do. So what's going to happen? Like, Sunak doesn't want him going to Reform UK. It may be that Lee Anderson, I don't know, like, it might be that he wants to and he's, he, he's done this deliberately to try and get himself into Reform UK after a, a, a particular period. Uh, Johnny Copper does £2 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee Anderson, culture warrior of war. He's useless, though. He's, unless Lee Anderson has done this deliberately, he's, it just basically shows he's an idiot. Um, so... I mean, consider Lee Anderson, right? Consider what he did last month. He resigned as deputy party chair so that he could vote against the government, then decided not to vote against the government because Labour MPs were sniggling at him, to use the term at the time. And so he abstained. And then a week later, he says he wished he'd voted with the government. The man's an idiot. Um, but anyway, the um, so... You've got, but then on the other side of it, you've got more moderate Tories, particularly Muslim Tories, but not exclusively Muslim Tory MPs, who are attacking Sunak. We've had um, Raymond Chisty, uh, he's, he's a lesser known Tory MP, but he was saying, I think the implication was this would have been during the summer 2022 summer leadership contest, that Rishi Sunak told him personally that he would deal with Islamophobia in the party and that he would work with Chisty to do that. And then, so Raymond Chisty was being interviewed by Sky last night and, and they said, oh, so Rishi Sunak didn't keep his promise then. He says, Rishi Sunak, ha I haven't seen him for over a year and a half. So Rishi, so now you've got this idea that Rishi Sunak personally promised to deal with Islamophobia. And this has been an issue in the Tory party. I want you to take you back even further. The 2019 leadership contest after Theresa May resigned Lots, quite a lot of those Tory candidates, I think it might have been even all of them at one point, said that they would launch an investigation into Islamophobia in the Tory party. And I think Boris, jo I need to check on this. I think Boris Johnson was one of them and obviously he won. He did not do that. So it's like, it's one of these issues where they keep promising, where leaders keep promising, or would-be leaders keep promising to do something about it. Nothing ever happens about it. They just deny it even exists, right? And, you know, there was um, someone was on doing the interview round. I need to check who it was now. It's a shadow. No, no, it was not. Sorry. An actual minister. I think it was a junior minister, but I can't remember who it was. And they were being asked by Nick Ferrari, of all people. Nick Ferrari. He is very much on the Tories side. But at the same time, he is still like he does still ask questions. So he was asking you know, uh, about Lee Anderson's comments. And this minister, this minister apparently was saying the comments were wrong. He says, were they Islamophobic? And he was saying they were wrong. But, but were they Islamophobic? They, they were wrong. 
So he wouldn't say yes or no whether they would. It's like the Tories cannot even use the word. But it's, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, abs you know, so Sunak has got himself into this position where there's a culture war that he didn't want that is splitting his party because you've now even got moderates who are trying to back Sunak up who are going, you're getting this wrong. So he's pissing everyone off. Sunak has no allies in this culture war, none at all. And it's not like he's strong enough to fight a culture war on his own. I mean, no political leader would. And he's, and he's got himself into it by trying to appease the people who would never support him, the people who've been openly calling for him to be removed. And he's pissing off what were his own allies. And it's, it's, I mean, the perfect culture war for the Tories is something that unites the Tory party and divides at least one of their opponents, preferably Labour, but at least one of, I mean, who are their main opponents? Uh, Labour, the Lib Dems and the SNP. Not, and Reform UK these days, thanks to them. This issue does not divide any of those parties. Although Ben have Reform UK appear to be divided on whether Lee Anderson should join them. But the issue doesn't divide them. The issue does not divide any of those four parties, but it does divide the Conservative Party. So straight away, that is a bad culture war for the Tories to be fighting. And second of all, it's all happening just as they're gearing up for their big budget announcement, which is already tricky enough as it is, because they're trying to find. They're trying to find a, um, a way of cutting income tax without cutting spending in a way that loses them more votes and in a way that makes the figures add up. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies are the latest group to say, yeah, this is not happening. Uh, Johnny Copperhead, five pounds tip chat. Thank you very much. Says, uh, Boris's letter, uh, Boris Letterbox Johnson didn't order an investigation to Tory Islamophobia. What a shock. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but what the point I was trying to make is it has been considered an issue for some time. And, um, and now it's coming back to bite Sonak on the arse. You know, we could, I mean, we end up in a situation, like I keep saying, the Tories have clearly been aiming for a May election. I keep saying, yes, they're giving themselves the option of order. I'm not saying they're committed to May. I don't think that. I think they're trying to have a May election. And yet, something like this could actually tilt the odds slightly in favour of, of autumn again, because, you know, it, it, the budget is part of their strategy. This budget announcement next week is part of their election strategy. So what does he do? He either needs to deal with this issue this week so that the tension, he needs all the media attention to be on that budget next week in glowing terms, not in like critical terms, of course, but he needs the front page is to be all about how brilliant a budget is. He wants next Thursday's front pages, the headlines, to be all about this wonderful budget. And uh, they'll probably guess it's not going to be like that in the Mirror or the Guard. Uh, but in terms of their main papers, as well as on the BBC, they want all the talk to be about the budget and about the tax cuts. They do not want it to be about this continuing race route. But then think to yourself, just say morning or a bit late. Uh, you're actually only a bit late because we started very late, I'm afraid. I mean, think about it like this. Like, seriously, what does Rishi Sunak do about it? What does he do about it? He can't just restore the whip because then he loses all pretense. Uh, it's, it, it's like then Rishi Sunak has to say that he got it wrong. And in fact, it's not like he just got it wrong. He's backed down to pressure. So he loses all pretense. Or, it's quite clear he doesn't have authority but he loses all pretense at authority. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, you know, and then, uh, so what he needed Lee Anderson to do was apologise, at least for the language. Like the Conservatives at the weekend left the door open for Lee Anderson. They said, look, we, you know, it was the language that was clumsy. It was the language that was clumsy. He just needed to apologise for that. Whereas Lee Anderson has said, it's a sign of weakness to apologize for something about which you are right. So he's saying, no, I'm right. He actually did. I thought he was moving towards that position.
because he did himself say the language was clumsy. So it's like he was in unison. He was in step with the Tory leadership. So I thought they were talking to each other and they were working out a way to get him back. But then he said, no, uh, you know, the language was clumsy, but I was essentially right. And he's now trying to claim he went, walked into an Ashfield pub and got a round of applause. I mean, maybe he did. You know, I can't imagine the pubs he goes to are the sort of ones that most people go to. But nonetheless, but there we go. Um, all a May election will do for Sonic is cut short his journey on the gravy train. Well, it, it's not a gravy train for him as such. Like, remember, uh, he doesn't care. He, he's rich enough to have all the trappings of power anyway. The, the, main, the main thing for Sonak was what's in the budget. That's what makes him rich. And the budget, once the budget's announced, that's it. He doesn't get any extra benefit from hanging on. You know, at the end of March, um, whatever... Whatever Sunak is going to get this year, he's already got. Because remember, there's two things that Sunak will be after. First of all, the budget to make him or his family richer. So the budget will be announced. That's it, done. Nothing else to happen the rest of the year. The second thing is, of course, the India trade deal, an agreement in principle. But remember, India, it doesn't matter when our general election is, India's general election is in May, which means their campaign starts in April. As soon as that campaign starts, Modi loses all interest. He won't be interested after the election. You know, it's, a, it, it's, it's not vital for him, but I get the impression Modi would like, he, he would like um, to have the trade deal announced for the election. Why not? But uh, if it's not announced in time for the election campaign, it's, of not, it's not really of much value to him. So again, by the end of March, Sunak will have whatever he's going to get. So hanging on for an extra, you know, hanging on until October doesn't get him anything extra as far as I can see. Now, there might be lots of, was it the local spins? It may well have been. The, the, the ones that, the, there might be ones still open in Ashfield. They're closing down all the time, aren't they? But they are, uh, oh, did Labour Rochdale bloke lose the Labour whip or kicked out the party? Neither. Um, he hasn't got a whip to lose. You know, the whip is for people in Parliament. So he's not in Parliament, uh, so he didn't have the whip to lose. Also, he hasn't been kicked out of the party, as far as I know. He's just been dropped as their candidate. You know, he's still a Labour councillor, as far as I know. He's still a Labour... In fact, he is. He's still a Labour councillor, isn't he? He's just not... So, yeah, he hasn't been kicked out of the party, and he hasn't lost the whip because he didn't have the whip to begin with. He wasn't in Parliament. He's just been dropped as their candidate. It will still be on the ballot as Labour because the deadline's passed, so the ballot's already been like printed. Uh, on the Tory WhatsApp group, didn't someone reference Rishi as nutsack? Yeah, clearly has the respect to his party. To be fair, though, I mean, every leader will have rebels. Every leader will have those who don't like them. That's the same in any party. Maybe if you're a really... I, I will say maybe the only party where that's not the case is the Green Party because, like, the Green Party's got one MP. Uh, <laughs> And also, although actually Caroline Lucas is not, of course, leader of the Green Party, but I think she gets on well with the leaders of the Green Party. Um, but but yeah, so um, but in other political parties, particularly large political parties where you've got quite a few MPs, there's always dissatisfaction. I mean, even the DUP, which is a small party, Sammy Wilson is not happy with the leader. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, what do I think Sunak will do to deal with Anderson? Is he trapped by the language used by members of the cabinet? I think he is trapped because, on the one hand, this row is likely to continue on, until he needs to resolve it. And the way it gets resolved, ultimately, is Lee Anderson has to have the whip restored. But how to do it? You cannot just restore the whip. Some Something has to happen to make them think this is all we needed from the start. Now, They've said that it's because Anderson hasn't apologised. So I think what may have to happen at the very least is Anderson will have to make a statement of regret. You know, like Pretty Patel's, oh, I'm sorry you felt that way. So Lee Anderson may have to say, oh, I'm sorry you felt that my words were inappropriate. Uh, they might have been a little bit clumsy, but, you know, um, I'm sorry you felt that way. And maybe that will be enough. But uh, at the same time, it does sound to me like if Sunak restores the whip to Lee Anderson, who is refusing to apologise for the sentiment as well as the words, 
that he also has a problem elsewhere. But then it could be argued that people kicking up a stink um, on the anti-Islamophobia side are not powerful enough to cause Sunak as many problems as those on the far right. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's... Uh, uh, Sweller says that the Tories are run by Islamists after all the uh, Tories are in power and she said that Islamists run the country. Yeah, I mean, uh, people, you said, I've said myself, how is it that Lee Anderson... Because essentially, here's the difference between what Braverman said and Lee Anderson said. Lee Anderson said that he thought Sweller Braverman was wrong. He said he did not think Islamists were in charge of Britain. He said that they thought he thought that they were in charge of Sadiq Khan and therefore London. So in terms of what Anderson did that Braverman didn't, first of all, he said the problems concentrated in one part of Britain, not the whole of Britain. And it seems to be from the Tories point of view, they're saying it's because he mentioned an actual politician as being complicit with it, whereas Sweller Braverman didn't. That apparently makes it different. That is apparently from the Tory warped Tory point of view. What makes it unacceptable for Anderson is he's claiming that a named politician is complicit in it, whereas Bravman isn't. Uh, but there we go. Um, uh, you said what he said was a vote winner anyway for Rochdale. Um, I mean, I would disagree with that, but it makes no difference whether it is or it isn't. Uh, you know, it, you do not want politicians engaging in conspiracy theories ever about anything. That is the essence of populism. If you say something to win votes that you know is a harmful lie, I know in politics there's always a bit of deception, right? And you can do it with the best of intentions. But if you tell a harmful lie to win votes, you are a populist. And, and I do not want any populists within Labour. I would, I mean, you know, it's not even like it's the difference between winning or losing the election. It's not even realistic the difference between winning or losing Rochdale. If he hadn't said it, right, if he hadn't said it, Al Azhar Ali, or hadn't been recorded saying it, Azhar Ali would have won this election this week, hands down, without ever saying it. So to say it's a vote winner isn't really, you know, I just don't think it's objectively true because he was going to win that election without, without saying it. And now that he has said it, he might not win. He might still win. It might be enough people... And if he does win, it'll be down to two things. First of all, people ultimately voting for the box that has Labour in it. Or second, because people don't want George Galloway to win. But in actual fact, George Galloway might win. And that will and, and that will be because Azar Ali said that. Because he will have chased away the, the sort of voters who don't want that sort of rhetoric. But in actual fact, I hope Ali does win because he's the lesser of evils, realistically. Uh, realistically, the only it, no one else has a cat in else chance as far as I, I mean, I know there's no polling there and the whole thing's gone tits up, but it really just seems incredible. Um, uh, Labour's going to go into likely going to have a different candidate. I mean, they're definitely going to have a different candidate for Rochdale in the general election, uh, possibly Paul War. He was one of the uh, shortlisted candidate. I, th I think it was ultimately. I, I don't. I didn't see the the breakdown of the votes, but I think it was ultimately between Ali and War. Um, who knows? Who knows? Um, but there we go. Uh, why are religious comments more valuable than comments direct to the poor, the ill and the vulnerable? So it's an interesting one. You probably need a sociology to discuss it. I'll tell you what I, I, I find, just to add something in, because we are sort of now out of time. Um, what I would suggest is, so have I have had people saying, like, I'm calling this a race row, right? And it's a racism issue. And people are saying, well, it's not racism because it's about a religion. And I, I get that. But, I'll, but my argument there is, First of all, there isn't really any fundamental difference between racism and, you know, uh, bigotry against people because of their religion. It's ultimately about it's tribalism. It's toxic tribalism, however you look at it. But that's not my argument. My argument is there's a reason why these people are Islamophobic without being anti-Semitic. Because there are anti-Semites in, in the Tory party as well and on the right, 
no point in denying that. But there's a there's open Islamophobia in the way that there is not open anti-Semitism. In fact, when a Tory is found to have been anti-Semitic, they tend to be dealt with in a way that they're not dealt with when they're Islamophobic, right? And I think that is because in the minds of these people, Jewish people are white. Now, we know not all Jewish people are white, but in their minds, Jewish people are white, right? And Muslim people, even though there are some white Muslims as well, Muslim people are brown, right? That is in, that's in their minds. So that is what makes it an issue of race. It's got nothing to do with the fact that um, it's of a particular religion. It's not that they've got any issue with the religion as such, which is very similar to, to Judaism. I mean, you've got to remember, Muslims consider, um, you know, the, the sort of Jewish and, and, and Christian prophets to be, you know, have been good spiritual men. Sometimes prophets consider prophets themselves, right? But it's... Um, I uh, need to wrap it up. Yeah, sorry, I will wrap it up. Sorry. So I will just say that's what it is for me. It's it's that it is a race issue because what they see is a way to beat brown people. They know they can't attack brown people for being brown, but they can attack them for their religion. But there we go. We do have to finish it there. Sorry, Graham's got to get on his way. Uh, thanks very much for coming, everyone. Don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, I'll see you later.